we, we heard earlier at the conference uh, from IEA that uh, this period of low oil and natural gas prices uh, is tough in terms of transition to renewables because, you know, uh, some of it uh, s s brings down the cost. So from your perspective, a low price environment for oil and gas, is that a positive in terms of declared goals of uh, more renewable energy or in general terms as well? Well, I mean, uh, first of all, as I said out there, I mean, I, we have to also recognize the, uh, the consumer benefits of uh, of those uh, lower lower energy costs, consumer benefits, and and uh, for that matter, a manufacturing sector, etc. Now, in terms of the industry itself, uh, uh, obviously there there's a lot of strains. With regard to the renewables, uh, I think, and I'm I'm going to talk about about the United States. Okay, uh, we have seen certainly no slowdown in the uh, introduction of uh, wind and solar, let's say, from the last couple of years of, of, uh, of low oil prices. We should remember that uh, two things. One is the price, the costs of those renewables has also gone down very, very dramatically. Uh, and uh, certainly, uh, you take solar, uh, I, would, I would argue that there are many, uh, many situations uh, in which uh, it is actually quite, uh, quite competitive. Uh, clearly, uh, yeah, well, it's, it's a more complicated issue. Uh, the, uh, but in addition, we have uh, state policies. We have uh, renewable portfolio standards uh, in, uh, uh, in you know, roughly half the states, I think a bit more than half the states. Uh, uh, so, you know, so, so these, are, these are going forward. We have, we have, uh, we have uh, different business models uh, uh, for solar, for example, uh, in terms of... Uh, in terms of uh, the, the the leasing arrangement, if you, if you like, so whatever. So I would say the uh, uh, the low gas prices. So we're talking 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 first about electricity. So it's natural gas prices. Uh, low natural gas prices have certainly had a much more substantial impact to date on uh, coal and nuclear. Uh, coal, obviously, the the uh, the reversal in terms of market share. Uh, with gas now slightly ahead of, of coal. Uh, and nuclear, especially in places like the upper Midwest, uh, with older, especially single unit plants, um, uh, shutting down. We've had, you know, half dozen or so uh, uh, closures. So actually the low natural gas price has, if anything, affected, uh, I would say, nuclear and, uh, and coal more, uh, uh, more strongly to date. On the oil side, which for the United States is about transportation, uh, clearly, I, th I think it's pretty clear there's been impact on things like electric vehicle uh, uh, sales. Uh, the uh, uh, certainly the the, uh, the at these prices, the target for next generation biofuels uh, obviously is then kind of even tougher to uh, to meet. But once again. You know, I'm not arguing merits or anything, but as a fact, we still have a requirement for uh, alcohol fuels in, in, in gasoline. Uh, so, you know, I think, uh, uh, I think those are the realities. And finally, from the point of view of the Department of Energy, at least, and our technology development responsibilities, you know, we, we don't follow short-term price variations. Uh, we are, you know, we are going to need technology innovation that continues to drive down costs of, of, of low carbon, uh, low carbon technologies uh, for a long time, and so it certainly is not impacting at all uh, our uh, our R and D portfolio. Marty Rosenberg of the Energy Times. Uh, Ted Koppel has a book out called Lights Out, where he talked to sixty folks across the utility industry and government. And I don't want you to necessarily address his point that he believes a cyber attack is likely. I'd like you to address his point that if it were to occur and he thinks it's likely, the U.S. government is not prepared to deal with it. Can you address that, please? 
Well, we have been certainly focusing very significantly on, on, on this issue. Uh, the, uh, look, the federal government obviously does not regulate directly, clearly, uh, utilities. We work with the utilities. We work with the EEI, uh, for example, uh, in a uh, energy system uh, coordinating committee, uh, looking at resilience of infrastructure. Uh, currently, by the way, uh, I, I'm sure it'd be fine. I, I can say the, the chair, the chair of that right now is Tom Fanning, the CEO of uh, Southern. Uh, Tom Kuhn from EEI plays plays a big role, uh, and um, we. Um, we have gone to the stage of uh, providing security clearances for some key members of the industry uh, so that we can share some, some intelligence uh, with them and share some technology knowledge which is not, not, not in the public, uh, public domain. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to be Pollyannish about it and say that, you know, we have some kind of a, a magical solution here, but, but we have been working Quite a bit with the with the, uh, uh, the utilities to harden them against uh, cyber attacks. But but if there were a, an attack that plunged the Northeast into a blackout for several months, as Mr. Koppel posits, what would the government response be? Well, I I mean that's a, a speculative. Uh, a situation. Uh, our 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 job is to avoid uh, that kind of that kind of uh, uh, very significant. You know, I, I can't get into too much detail for obvious reasons, but it's not as though there have not been lots of attempts. Uh, it is. I think we have stated that uh, that a very significant number of cyber attacks have been on energy infrastructure. Uh, and uh, and obviously we have not seen anything anything like that scale of of of, uh, of impact uh, that uh, that you referred to, but it's a very serious issue. And and the and the thing is here, this is one where you know the the enemy uh, is not static, uh, and and that's one of the one of the one of the tough issues that has to be addressed. Gail Reitenbach, Power Magazine. Um, Following the February 2014, oh, sorry, the light right over your That's head. Okay. <laughs> Following the February 2014 problems at the waste isolation pilot project in New Mexico, and given the DOE's recent issuing of a preliminary notice of violation for its operator and uh, lands for health and safety, safety violations, what are the prospects for that site or a similar one serving as a permanent? future waste disposal facility for spent nuclear fuel? Because post Yucca Mountain, WIP was seen as kind of the next best hope. Where does that stand now? Uh, well, first, first of all, let me make clear that we are, we believe we are still on track for uh, safely resuming operations uh, at WIP uh, uh, this year, late, uh, late in the year. Uh, but uh, there is no, there's no place that we are talking about specifically, specific site, uh, for spent fuel uh, uh, disposal. Uh, the, we have just started a consent-based process. Uh, we have a request for information out uh, for communities, states to come forward for discussing the issues of nuclear spent fuel storage and or disposal uh, and or what's called, well, I won't go into this unless you want, but, but defense high-level waste, uh, which we are now authorized to, to pursue on a separate track from uh, civilian spent fuel. So, on the, But on civilian spent fuel, uh, we are starting the consent-based process. We have requested funds in fiscal year 2017 uh, to go to a next phase in which we would be uh, offering uh, support, financial support for communities that are seriously interested in pursuing the idea, to give them the ability to hire their own consultants, do, do analyses, et cetera. So uh, that's, that's what we're doing. Uh, let me, again, I want to get very clear, WIP is for transuranic waste, uh, and uh, that's what 
we aim to reopen it for uh, late this year. Uh, Amy Harder with the Wall Street Journal. Um, so two quick questions. Um, putting politics aside, um, what would you say is the most economically efficient proposal um, to address climate change, an oil tax, a gasoline tax, or a carbon tax? And then secondly, early on in your talk with Dan, you said that there wasn't a magic wand that uh, the Energy Department had to address low oil prices and impact on the industry. Are you actively exploring any sort of government mechanism that could somehow help these companies um, dealing with low oil prices? Thank you. What was the first question? <laughs> what do you think is the most economic? Oh, uh, for car. That's right. Uh, Well, look, I, I'm, uh, I'm, A, I'm not an economist. B, I haven't done uh, the uh, uh, economic alternatives uh, analyses. Uh, but uh, I think the, I, I believe it is, it is certainly the case that we uh, must move at some time in the future to an efficient economy-wide approach to carbon. Uh, I think, you know, the, the President's Climate Action Plan is ambitious, uh, but inherently, uh, without getting new statutory authorities, uh, inherently uh, is kind of a sector-by-sector -sector approach. We do efficiency standards, we do CAFE standards, we do clean power plan, et cetera. Uh, and, and together, I mean, these are, these, are, these are pretty effective, but I think in the end, um, uh, when we start talking about, you know, really getting down to the to decarbonizing the electricity sector and, and very, very low carbon levels, I think we're going to need to have an, an efficient economy-wide approach. Certainly a carbon charge uh, is, uh, is one way to do that. Uh, uh, and even then, there are many variations. Is it a, is it a, would it be a carbon charge which is, that is revenue neutral uh, uh, or not, uh, et cetera? There have been various ideas about various tax reductions, et cetera, uh, which may have distributional impacts. So, you know, so I think, you know, uh, I, I think to me the main thing is moving to an economy-wide uh, uh, consistent approach, uh, but that will require legislation, uh, and uh, it's not going to happen this year. Well, it depends what, I don't know what you mean by mechanisms. I mean, we are, uh, we are clearly uh, analyzing <laughs> continuously, watching and analyzing uh, the, uh, the uh, situation. Uh, but, um, you know, there aren't that many things that the Department of Energy, at least, can, uh, can, uh, can do in terms, of, in terms of directly interfering in the marketplace. And, and I think, frankly, even if we could, I'm not sure it's a good idea. Uh, so, uh, you know, we will continue our, our, our technology development. Uh, I have to say, even with the low prices, by the way, the industry itself, of course, shows tremendous innovation uh, in, uh, in terms of lowering, lowering, lowering costs, et cetera. So, uh, look, I, I, I think that, you know, it's, uh, it's a market situation. Uh, it'll play itself out. We are in a fundamentally a strong position. Uh, with our uh, with our resources, uh, and um, and I think you know we'll just keep keep talking. Hi, uh, Orange Kutlu from another news agency in Turkey. Uh, you said uh, when we, you were talking to Mr. Yergin, uh, energy uh, security is a collective action, and European insecurity would affect the U.S. too. What is the likelihood that uh, the American LNG exports would find its way to Europe and decrease its dependency on Russian gas imports? Well, so first of all, and especially with regard to Turkey, I mean, we, you know, we, uh, I want to first say that, you know, we've been very supportive, frankly, including the meeting that I co-chaired in, in Istanbul a couple of years ago, uh, very supportive about the Southern Corridor uh, to bring Caspian gas uh, uh, to, to Europe. Uh, and uh, and potentially, eventually, uh, Eastern Mediterranean uh, uh, gas as well. Uh, in terms of the LNG exports, uh, we've always made it clear that uh, we are not uh, determining the destination of the cargoes, uh, we, the U.S. government. Uh, so that it's up to the companies uh, to, uh, to do typically long-term contracts 
uh, 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 for the for the cargoes. But if, certainly, if the United States becomes a, as I expect, we will become a, a very significant uh, LNG exporter, uh, putting those cargoes into the into the global market uh, is is in and of itself helping to uh, to diversify sources and and. Uh, um, uh, uh, provide other 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 opportunities for, for for Europe in addition to American cargoes. Let me make it very clear. I mean that there are American cargo, there are contracts that have been signed Thank you very much with for joining us, um, Carlos Pascual, senior with with European uh, European uh, companies. So to have an extraordinary ministerial dialogue. Uh, today's gas week of Sirweek, and what? Oh. <laughs> Uh, uh, and, and I'll just make the one last thing I'll just say is, of course, there is also the ongoing negotiation of TTIP, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, if that is if that is completed, uh, it's it obviously may very well have substantial implications as well for for um, uh, LNG exports. Uh, <laughs> Hello, my name is Ekaterina Sobol. I'm from Russian news agency Ria Novosti. Where are you? Uh, oh. And I have a very important <laughs> question to you. <laughs> um, um, large producers, oil producers, are talking about uh, freeze oil production. Um, uh, the general secretary of OPEC uh, told yesterday that are will very happy to talk with U.S. Uh, did you get any invitation from APEC? And uh, in your opinion, has it any sense to freeze production? Thank you. Well, look, in the United States, we don't, we don't determine the, the production levels of, of, of our producers, plain and simple. So that's the answer. Well, I, I, I keep my understanding is that there have been speakers here, and uh, Minister Naimi, the OPEC uh, uh, General Secretary, et cetera, that have laid out the parameters. And uh, uh, it, uh, I'm not sure what I, I'm, I'm not sure what a freeze uh, means in any case at a level that is already oversupplying the market. So. Uh, they can have their discussion. Uh, we do not control. We do not attempt to control the level of production uh, of our of our producers. Thank you, um, Secretary Moniz. Um, so, um, talking about the SPR for a moment, Harry Weber from Bloomberg. I'm sorry. Um, there's been some talk about uh, upgrades to the SPR. Um, will you submit the SPR to report to Congress in May? And um, is that still on track? Can you just talk a little bit about that? Yes, it is our, it is our intention to, uh, to submit a report and to submit a budget amendment uh, to uh, free up the first tranche of funding uh, to begin the modernization program. In May? By May. Mm hmm Thank you. Mm hmm Hi, um, I'm sorry, Elsa Galesa for the French paper, Les Echos. Uh, you mentioned earlier the, the lift of the oil export ban. Um, what do you think this will change in the medium and long term for the, the American oil industry, the shale industry? And do you think that at some point the, the United States will become independent in terms of oil? Well, the, um, first of all, I, I, when it comes to oil, I don't like talking long term, <laughs> unless you define long term according to the cycles in the oil industry. Uh, but uh, but I, but if we look if we look ahead, uh, and I've, I've I've been very consistent upon this, including at the Syrup Week meetings now for a couple couple of years, uh, that uh, the fundamentals uh, to, do not seem to me to be there to have U.S. oil exports. Uh, at least, you know, and guess again in the foreseeable future, in the the, the near term, uh, to have them be, you know, major changes in the market. Uh, we are we are, we import seven million barrels a, a day of crude oil. Uh, we also effectively export oil 
millions of barrels a day as oil products. Uh, now, uh, furthermore, the spreads in the benchmark prices are not there to, sudden, to suddenly, you know, stimulate, uh, in my view, a huge, huge export. Uh, in fact, the Louisiana Light uh, Index, which I think is a more appropriate comparison index to Brent than is WTI, it's, it's trades above Brent. So I just don't understand how the fundamentals would go there. Now, there is the issue of really light oil uh, uh, going to, to places, countries, places, refineries that really need light oil uh, to, uh, to operate uh, uh, more, uh, more effectively. And I think that's part of what's, what we're seeing, we're seeing uh, some of that happen. So, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, clearly, not, clearly <laughs> by definition, it's now the market will, will determine where that, where that goes. I just don't see the fundamentals there today, at least, to have a, a, huge, a huge impact. In a, any fundamentals for uh, for developer? Yeah, I'm from Belarus. Yeah. Uh, you tell me who you are, not not him. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, for developing electric vehicles, and what's your view? It's like we we we've seen big and flowers investment in shale oil. Do you expect those money will go to electric vehicle vehicle development, or what's your view on that? It's like a transportation oil, uh, transportation as, as a uh, ma major oil, um, um, like driver, not driver, like consumer. Uh, you mean you mean driverless yeah. cars? Is that what you mean? I'm sorry. No, electric no. vehicles. Yes. Well, now cars uh, um, consume very uh, a lot of oil, and if they switch to electric mm -hmm. vehicles. Do you think it's like plausible future or? Yeah, okay, so, so let, me, let me just say again. First of all, let me say what we do. Uh, certainly, we, I mean, I mean this, our administration, uh, has certainly um, supported the increased natural gas and oil production. But, as I said already, we still import 7 million barrels a day of crude oil. So we remain committed to our work on reducing oil dependence. And that has three pieces. One piece is increased efficiency of vehicles. For example, the CAFE standards. A second piece is continuing the development and the cost reduction of advanced alternative fuels next generation biofuels, for example. And third is electrification of vehicles, uh, which includes both battery and fuel cell. Uh, we remain very committed to that. And can I imagine a future where it's a big deal? Absolutely. Uh, yes, pick a number. Uh, the. Um, uh, but I think part of it is going to be uh, probably a, a, a different pattern of use in which, uh, especially for battery-driven uh, uh, battery cars, um, it's you know, principally, I would say, in, in urban environments. Uh, but I think you know, the whole, again, business models are changing. Uh, ownership of vehicles is changing. Uh, and, um, and I think that... Uh, uh, Elect electrified vehicles fit very, very comfortably and nicely into an urban environment, uh, particularly in terms of other things that can that can happen. Um, uh, I mean, an electrified car has uh, some of the infrastructure you would like for other services. Uh, an electrified car can fit. We'll see where this goes, but um, driverless cars. I mean. I think you, again, I'm not being Pollyannish here because there are clearly major challenges, but uh, driverless cars, I would be surprised if anybody here, even two years ago, would have expected where that has come 
in this time, uh, where you're talking about, uh, it's, and it's not, it's, it's everything from Google to major auto com companies that are investing a lot of money in this technology. And one reason is that it is a technology that genuinely offers new services to the consumer, as opposed to just the same box with the same steering wheel uh, that may have a different motor or a different, uh, you know, different number of seats or whatever. This is a genuinely new paradigm. Uh, some of the opportunities it opens up themselves present challenges. Uh, like, for example, uh, visually impaired people. But then that opens up issues. What are liability? How are liability laws going to be arranged? So, et cetera. But going back to the original point is, that's an example of a technology platform that could be revolutionary and that really fits into the electrified vehicle space. So, so I think it's it's extremely interesting, and uh, and I'm 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 very bullish. Last question, right here. Chris Peterson from Blatch. Thank you for your remarks. Uh, with the cafe standards that you guys have proposed and uh, have already enacted, can you discuss how you've looked at the development of the internal combustion and the the recent developments that have happened with that in terms of uh, the optimism, at least from the market, and how much for the the internal combustion engine can be innovated to uh, reach these new CAFE standards? No, that's, that's a really good question because I think the, uh, uh, I mean, I think often we forget that the internal combustion engine has got a ways to go as well, uh, potentially, and, uh, and, uh, and certainly uh, the, first of all, I think you have to look at it as not just the engine, but the integrated system of engine fuel and Structure, lightweight, light weighting, et cetera, uh, and other issues, tires, you, 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 you name it. Uh, uh, but on the engine itself, clearly a, uh, a drive towards uh, higher compression, uh, you know, smaller turbocharged uh, engines uh, uh, can really add a lot of efficiency with little. Uh, impact or no impact on, on performance. So, uh, so I think that's there, but I think, again, it's going to be the integrated system. Uh, you can do a lot more with a, with, a lighter, with a lighter vehicle, as long as it remains safe, obviously. Um, uh, fuels, uh, is there really, a quite, I'll ask you a question, is there any real reason why we should not have flex fuel vehicles? Um, I mean, it's not like this requires a technical a genius at the moment to uh, to rather cheaply <laughs> uh, provide a new capability, a new a new optionality. So I think there's still lots lots of space to innovate, and 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 the winner in all this is is not is not entirely clear. As I suggested earlier in talking about the and turning the electric vehicle to the urban environment, I think the use environment is going it may very well lead to rather different different technology choices. Thank you.